why don't you go ahead and have a seat for a moment? Well, I want to welcome you to service this morning, whether you're watching online from wherever you're watching or whether you're in the room. It's a great morning to worship. Our mission as a church is to pursue the Father, to proclaim Jesus, and to participate with the Holy Spirit in his work in the world. And as we worship, what we're doing corporately is we're pursuing the Father. We're looking at God and saying, God, we, we love you, we worship you, and we adore you. And I enjoy each week when we get to pursue the Father together in that way. If you're a guest with us this morning, if you're new to Revive and you're sitting here in the room, right in front of you, there's a card that says, I'm new here. We'd love for you to fill that out so we can begin a relationship with you, to get to know you, to, to start a conversation. So if you could fill that out and if you could bring it to the Connection Center out in the lobby after service, we'd love to greet you and get to know you. You can also text the word REVIVE to the number 94000 and the digital version of that card will show up on your phone and then you can fill it out that way. But either way, I'd really love if you, if you're a guest, could fill it out. This is a big place and it can be hard to find your way and this is one way we can help bridge that gap for you. On Coming up on May 1st is one of my favorite things we do as a church. I know I'm skipping over Good Friday and Easter for just a moment, but on May 1st, we're having a baptism service where we get to celebrate, right, it's one of those moments where we get to celebrate the life change that's happening in our midst. So if you've recently given your life to Jesus, you said, Jesus, I want to follow you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, or maybe you've done that a while ago and you've never been baptized, this, this is your chance. We need you to sign up by April 15th uh, because at, at that point we're going to collect stories because one of the beautiful things I love about what, how we're doing baptisms now is we're reading people's stories so we can enter into the life change and to hear what's happening in each and every one of them. So if, if you're interested, baptisms are coming. And also we're having a member orientation. Now, sometimes people say, why do I need to be a member of the church? What's the big deal? I'm here every week. I participate in worship. But why do I need to be a member? Well, membership has privileges. I don't know if it does. But you do get a decoder ring and a special. It's, all, it's great. You get all of that. But really, it's you identifying and saying, this is your church. Do you support the ministries? You support the staff of this church and you're committed to engaging. You get to vote on some things that are voted on like the pastor and the budget. Everybody gets to vote, but we really have to count the members' votes as a legal way to measure those things. So if, if you've been here, if you're wondering, or if you just want to check out and see what we have to say on that membership day, you can just show up. But the information's on the screens about when it is and where it is, but it's coming up right after Easter. And... I'm really excited about our Easter celebration. Who, who loves Easter? Anyone, anyone here an Easter fan? It is the day in our faith where we really get to remember and celebrate Jesus' work on the cross. But before Easter comes Good Friday. And Good Friday is the chance for us to say, Jesus, we see what you did. We see you. We hear you. We understand. It's a chance for us to enter into his suffering. And on Good Friday, we're having two services at 5 and 7 o'clock. All of our campuses will be together, all of our Revive campuses, but we're also inviting Southtown's Christian Center and Big Tree Wesleyan. They will be here too and participating in leading of the service. We're really excited for this time to come together on Good Friday and remember what Jesus did for us because I know the world needs to know. And we're going to remember that and, and spend time together on Good Friday so that on Easter, just two days, a few days later, we get to celebrate Jesus bursting forth from the grave. So on April 17th, if you didn't know, it's, it's Easter. And our whole series throughout Lent has been pointing towards Good Friday and Easter. And we're incredibly excited to celebrate those days with you. So mark those on your calendar if you haven't already. Invite family and friends. It's going to be an incredible celebration on Easter Sunday. And now I need to have a, a family chat for a moment. If you're a guest here, what I'm about to say and do, I don't often do. So this is sort of a moment. But I've been getting, and we as a staff have been getting a lot of feedback recently about the volume and the sound and what's happening in this room on a Sunday morning. And I just want to say we haven't let those, those emails and those texts and whatever go unnoticed. I, I just have to let you in on a bit of the story, though. 
the sound system in this room is actually failing. We blow out, there's speakers blown out uh, above me. If you, I, I don't know if I want to stand here because you don't know what's above my head right now. I might be like an ant under a shoe if it ever let go because it's huge. But they're failing. And because of their failing and the coverage is different in the room, some parts of the room are really hot and some aren't. And our sound guys have been trying to equal that out. Well, this is what we're going to do moving forward. We're going to make, and those of you who sit in the way back, I'm sorry, we're going to do our best to make the floor area right in front of me the best it can be. But it means that in the way back, you might not hear much of anything. It's just the coverage of the room, the way the speakers have have gone. The back of the room is going to be harder to hear in. So you might want to move forward eventually. Or if you like it like that, it's fine. You can stay there too. I won't take it personally. But we're, we're addressing the issue. We understand it's an issue. And actually, we're looking to replace the whole sound system in this room to have it be clearer and crisper. And we won't have to push it as hard. The price tag to do that is roughly $400,000. So if you have your checkbook, I'll take one check. Who's ever ready, we'll do it today. But it's definitely something to be praying about because as we do that, all of this needs to come down. It needs to be rebuilt. It wasn't built so you can just replace one speaker. It's a major remodel of the room, actually. So we're aware of the issue. We're working forward. We're making our best plans. But just... I just need you to know. And you can send me emails if you want. If it's too quiet, uh, I get them too loud. Now if I get something that is too quiet, I guess we're in the right spot, I guess. Um, but just be praying about that. I, I, it's, it's been one of those challenges. And again, I'm going way too long. Years ago, I was sitting somewhere up here with Pastor Greg, and we were looking up here, and I said, Greg, how are we ever going to change those speakers if they go bad? He said, I don't know. It's not my problem. I won't be here when it happens. <laughs> like, thanks, Greg. I... I appreciate that. Um, But anyway, thank you for being here and understanding that that's what's happening. We're doing our best to make sure it's as comfortable as possible for everybody in this room. Every week we, we do collect our offering and it's actually, it's not just something we do, it's a form of worship. To give your tithes and offerings is a saying to God, God, I, I worship you even with my resources, even with my finances. And I trust that you will do more with them than I ever could on my own. So as we give our offering today, if you came prepared to do so, there's giving boxes around the room. You can give online on our website or you can mail a check to this campus. But however you do so, it's an act of worship. Saying, God, I love you and I trust you even with this. Let me pray for our time together and our offering. Father, we thank you um, for this ability to gather We thank you that we're here in one place week after week, worshiping the God of God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And Father, as we worship you today, I pray that our praises would be a blessing to you. Father, I pray that everything else would fade away and we would just focus on you as we sing, as the object of our worship. Father, as we give our tithes and offerings, I ask that you would use them to further your work in the world that we would reach people in our towns and our neighbors and in the city and beyond who, who don't know you, that they would know and love and, and serve you the way we do. Because, Lord, our, our world needs to know. So we thank you for this time, and we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, please join with us as we worship the King of Kings.
Father, thank you that your spirit is here. We ask that you would lead and speak to us exactly what we need to hear today. And may you be honored by the praise that comes from You never 
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work. to be able to come and lift up praises of your great name for all that you've already done for us, God. We have no expectations. We just want you. Have your way in this place, God. Have your way in our hearts.
says that God's grace is manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and full of truth. Amen. Sing it with me. Thank you that it is just that, a gift. Not something that we can earn through good works, but something that you have promised to give us faithfully. Lord, thank you for being a perfect father who looks at us with mercy and grace. And as we continue into the message this morning, hearing from Pastor Cable, I pray that you intervene I pray that you allow us to hear what you need us to hear, what our heart needs to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I need to start with just addressing something many of you have asked me about in my short time here. I've worked at Revive now for a year and a half. And this is a moment of honesty between myself and all of you. These glasses are real. <laughs> I don't wear them casually. You should be appreciative that I wear them, especially when I'm driving. Uh, I don't know why that's been a common question I've been asked since getting here is, Cable, are those glasses real? And I'm just addressing it now while I have all of your attention. So we maybe don't ask that question anymore, but we can live in the understanding that I don't see correctly. <laughs> just, it was a moment of confession, guys. I had to do it. I'm not alone, thank, thankfully, in this, though. I'm looking around the room, and I'm seeing all these beautiful glasses looking back at me, and I know many of you are hiding your contacts from me as well. Uh, according to the Vision Council of America, which means I googled something, 75% uh, of us Americans need vision correction. 
which is pretty cool. I don't feel so alone when people ask me, do you need glasses? And I can remember this beautiful moment. If you could all picture me as a, a middle schooler, uncoordinated, unlike the rest of you middle schoolers here, and maybe a little pudgier than I am now, that sort of thing. Just think awkward middle schooler, unlike the rest of you middle schoolers here, please. And that was me. Last pick on the kickball team, was on the bench on my soccer team, really unathletic and unable to be competitive in anything I did. And it was my freshman year of school where somebody said, you need vision correction. And at the time, I wore contacts. Uh, they gave me contacts, and all of a sudden, I could make contact with the ball of my foot. It turns out I just didn't know where the ball was. <laughs> and so I could play sports, not that I was the best out there, but I wasn't the last pick anymore. That felt pretty good. And it wasn't like I moved from being an awkward eighth grader to being a super coordinated ninth grader, because ninth graders, I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> I, I didn't grow up that much. I just got glasses and it changed my life. It changed what I was experiencing. I could see differently. And when I started driving, there was no questions about whether or not I was seeing correctly. Now I do have to keep my prescription updated because this crazy thing happens. I'm not that much older now, but my eyes are getting worse. And so every few years I need to update my prescription so I can see properly and see what's happening in front of me on the road. And I'm sure many of you are just feeling so much relatability right now to this. You're like, yes, my eyes need that. They need that kind of love. Or you're avoiding it. And to those who have glasses at home and refuse to wear them, please wear them. We all need that from you. But today we're talking about eyes. That shouldn't shock you from my opening little conversation here. We're talking about vision. And I hope you'll be able to see the deep connection between glasses and lenses and corrected vision and our passage for today. My name is Pastor Cable, if we have not met yet. I'm the middle school pastor here at Revive Wesleyan, and it's a joy to work with your sons and daughters in the youth ministry. And I'm excited to speak to you today in the middle of our Lenten series, Signs. We're, we're taking this journey as a church through the Gospel of John. And John is a unique writer. There's four Gospels in the Bible, and they start the New Testament. If you need to look for them, go to the table of contents, find the New Testament. And the first four books, those are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're the Gospels. They're biographies of Jesus, this person that we talk about in church. They're biographies of his life. But John is pretty individual compared to the other three. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call synoptic, which is a fancy word for summary. They have the same source material, it seems. If you would imagine for a moment you have four kids, as I do at the Hub or in our youth ministry quite often, and they come running up to me and say, little Johnny did this to little Susie. And they all start telling me their story. Three of them sometimes seem to be really aligned. But then the one who hits somebody seems to have a very different point of view of the story. It doesn't mean what they're telling me is untrue. It means what they're showing me is a different perspective of that same story. And the other three are kind of having a much more commonality between their story as they're defending their friend who was injured. Now, John is not talking about hitting Jesus here, but I think that helps us understand it's just a different perspective of the story. John has a very individualized perspective. And as he's writing, he engages again and again with certain themes and rhythms and ways of thinking in his gospel that the other gospel writers just don't. Things like Pastor Steve mentioned last week, like water. John's gospel comes back to water again and again and again. Or bread a couple weeks ago when we talked about the feeding of the 5,000. John comes back to bread again and again and again. And this week, it's about light and dark. So if you have your Bible, we're in John chapter 9. And we're going to see Jesus follow this theme here. But he does so in a rhythm. A rhythm that he uses throughout his gospel. It starts when you see Jesus come onto the scene. He's going to declare that there's a different way of living. He calls it the kingdom of God. That the people who follow him could actually live and behave differently in their lives. There's this people, this group that are different and think and behave differently. And they belong to him and he's their king. They're the kingdom, the, the people of God. And he shares this good news that you can be a part of it throughout John's gospel. But then when he shares it, he follows it up typically with a miraculous sign. Something to demonstrate this new kingdom is real. Not just a concept or idea or pretty metaphor, but it actually has roots, that it actually causes life change and looks different. 
And then through these two movements, this declaration of the kingdom and this moment where he does something supernatural, he follows it up by trying to change how people are living. By seeing the ways that they are behaving now and saying, maybe that's not the way we should. Maybe this system that we're in doesn't work for us. Maybe the overarching way we think needs to change. Jesus challenges these unjust ways of living. And he does it throughout this gospel. John's very particular about his writing. And you're going to see it again here in John chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles open, it'll be on the screen as well. John chapter 9 verse 1. As he went along, that's Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So we just stop there for a moment because the disciples are introducing us right away to a particular way of thinking. They're saying there's sin in the world and there's bad things in the world. And the two are obviously connected in their minds. And at times they might be. But they have made a connection to this man's birth and his visual impairment and the fact his parents must have been bad people. And Jesus tears that down and says, why would we make that connection? See, it says in verse three, neither this man or his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And as I said, he's going with this theme of light and dark. But it's not original here. Jesus is not just coming up with this theme in chapter 9, part through the story and saying, I'm the light of the world. This has been part of his teaching throughout this gospel. This has been something he's been hitting on again and again. And so his disciples who had been following him, this would have made their ears ring. This would have made them say, wait a minute, you said that before. There's something here. There's something I need to understand. There's something you're teaching me. There's something you're declaring. It starts in John's gospel in chapter one. It says in verse five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness hasn't overcome it. That was actually a portion of that passage was read to us during worship today. And then again, in John chapter three, there's a story where a Pharisee comes and learns from Jesus at nighttime. It's dark all around them. And Jesus is teaching him and says, and the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. Or in John chapter eight, Jesus is teaching again. He spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. You will have the light that leads to life. Jesus is running with this metaphor. It's not something he just comes up with in the moment. It's something he's very methodically using to teach us something. It's something his disciples have been learning and hearing again and again. He's revealing something about himself through this. It's not a casual moment. Jesus has a purpose behind this. He's trying to tell this group of people something. And here's a blind man before them. A man who in some physical way is living in darkness, who physically cannot see the world around him. He can't perceive it in quite the same way you and I can. And Jesus says, there's a group of people in this world who live in darkness And I have come to expel that darkness. I'm like the sun rising. I'm the daytime. I bring light and change the perspective of everything around it. You know, we have lights and cameras and modern technology. So at nighttime, we're able to see pretty well. And that's why many of us have become night owls. We can see still. We can behave in normal ways. In ancient times, there was no way to see at night except through a torch or a small candle. And you who've been in power outages, all of us at some point, know that Those are just not the same as flicking on the light switch. You can't see the same. Jesus is speaking in a metaphorical way about a spiritual reality. He's making a pun. Kind of with the blind man right in front of him. There are people who live in darkness and I've come to bring light to their dark world. While they might not be able to see, I can show them how to see. I can show them how to behave and how to live. I am the light of the world is what he's saying. He's giving the disciples that kingdom, the declaration that something could be different in their lives. That there was a group of people who perceived the world differently, who had a different lens to look at the world through. And it had corrected their vision to see the way God wanted them to see. 
And then he follows it up with a miraculous sign. We've been talking about these seven signs of John's gospel and we'll continue that series next week. But here he performs another miracle. It says in verse six, after saying this, Jesus spat on the ground, made some mud with his saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. First of all, gross. (laughs) Second of all, I tried to imagine what that man was experiencing, the man born blind. I have obviously, well not obviously, but I've never had the same experience as a person who has vision impairment, so I don't want to speak out of hand. But some research shows that those who have vision impairment have much better hearing than the rest of us because they're compensating for the lack of vision they have in their lives. And so it's not crazy for us to assume that this man could hear the conversation about him happening on the street. It's not crazy to assume he heard the disciples say, who's the sinner here, him or his parents? Who caused this problem in his life? It's not improbable that this man heard Jesus then talk in this metaphor, I am the light of the world. And it's not improbable the man heard him spit. And it doesn't say Jesus asked for permission. He kind of invades this man's life and space. He just takes mud and puts it on his eyes and say, go and wash. Go and wash. So the blind man is obedient. He gets up and goes on a journey. There's a pool at the south side of Jerusalem called Siloam. And he went and washed his eyes and everything changed for him. Here was a man who said, there's a people who can see and behave differently because I'm the light of the world. And now there's a man who can physically say, I was blind, but now I see because there's a man named Jesus. Because there's a man named Jesus who healed me and changed me and called me and brought me into the fullness of what my life could be. But it wasn't just about the sight here. It's about the spiritual, spiritual aspect happening. You see, many of us listening, you're like, that's a great story. That's a great sign. That tells us about who Jesus is. But what does that mean for my life? What does that mean for me today? What does that mean for my week? Well, John chapter 9 is not done in verse 7. It continues on. And I can't read all of it to you today, but I would encourage you, take some time and read it. It should only take you about 15 minutes. And it tells this story. You see, there was another group of people who heard about the miracle because when something miraculous happens, it is hard to keep that quiet. Something transformative happened. Something so unexplainable, supernatural happened, everybody started talking about it. And this group called the Pharisees came to explore and understand. And when we hear the word Pharisees in church today, they have this history of this bad rap in our minds. But really, their purpose was never to make people have a harder life. They were just trying to help people worship better. There was a law that God gave in the beginning of the Bible and it had all these rules and functions and ways to worship him. And the Pharisees saw that and said, okay, if we want to worship God better, we need to understand these more. And so they created some more rules to help and created rules that if this is where God said the line was, we're going to draw the line back here so we'll never step over the line. We're going to understand and know God more. And they studied God and understood deep theology and everything else about God and the teachings of fathers and ancient people for thousands of years. These were the religious educated. They worshiped God. They longed for God's Messiah to come into the world. This person the Bible had promised throughout the Old Testament would make all things right. They were looking for him. They wanted him to come. But here's a man who's healing on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is a day that's devoted to the worship of God. It's devoted to rest. It's meant to be a day of no work so we can refocus our lives on who God is. Why would this man do something so unholy on the Sabbath as work? Why would he do that? So the Pharisees call together their group of people and they go and find the blind man who's no longer blind. And they question him and ask him about this healing and what happened and they got the details of the story And they don't like the answers. So the Pharisees go and they find this man's parents. And they say, tell us what happened. And is this really your son? And the parents say, that's definitely our child. But he's an adult and you can ask him questions because he's an adult. So stop talking to us. And so they go back to this man. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. And they start questioning him very directly. 
and they want certain answers and the man's not giving it. So the conversation turns pretty hostile. And let's pick it up in verse 25. He replied, whether this man is a sinner or not, I don't know. You can see where the Pharisee's reasoning is. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him. You are this fellow's disciple? We are disciples of Moses. If you don't know, Moses is the one who gave the law. They were trying to be obedient to what God had given them. We know that God spoke to Moses, but this is for this fellow. As for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a blind, man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. It's so funny that this chapter opens with Jesus' disciples saying, who sinned, this man or his parents? And we see the Pharisees return to the same thought. You were steeped in sin at birth. But Jesus enters the story and he challenges the way they're thinking. He challenges their unjust system and the way they perceive the world. See, it's so easy for us to look at the Pharisees and say, how did they miss it? They're so spiritually blind. Jesus taught and then healed. He told them what he was doing. He was witnessing, and this is chapter nine. He's been doing this for a while now. This isn't a new thing that Jesus is doing. He's been going around and teaching and healing people left and right. How did they not know who this person is? The Pharisees, all they wanted to do was keep the Sabbath holy. They wanted proper worship. They wanted it to be in a certain way, in a particular way. And here comes Jesus challenging the way they're behaving. And here's a man who's met Jesus and he seems to have been transformed. He calls himself their, his disciple. He says, I was blind, but now I see. He was a person who lived in darkness and now lives in light. He's the physical sign of a spiritual reality that Jesus brings us into the day. But the Pharisees look at it and say, he interrupted the way we're living, the system we have in this world. How could we trust him? He's a sinner. But it wasn't that Jesus was doing something unholy on the Sabbath. In fact, he was doing something holy on the Sabbath. He was teaching and healing people and declaring that the kingdom of God was at hand. It wasn't that the Sabbath was unholy. Or what Jesus did was unholy. It's that what Jesus did was holy. And the Pharisees missed it. Well, the man who had been blind understood. Don't you want to be his disciple too? Don't you want to learn from him? Don't you want to be near him? Don't you want to know him? You know, the truth is, those of us who call Revive home or you grew up in a church and have attended church for many years, we have a tendency to be more like the Pharisees in this story. I'm not trying to throw anything in your face. It's just the way we behave. We know God. We've studied God. We've been Christians for a long time. We've been obedient. We've followed God. We understand how to do things. And the people who are new to church, they just got to learn how we do it. Hey, this is the way we've always done it, so we're going to keep it this way. Hey, we're not going to change the music we're singing because we really like this old stuff. Hey, we're not going to go out and do that because this is how we do things here. We have the tendency to be the pharisaical ones. We have the tendency to say, did that miracle really happen? Did that story actually occur? Did that organization really get a check in the mail to fill their needs and the only explanation is someone felt a prompting to write them a check? 
Is that story about a man being healed from cancer during worship, is that really a true story? There's got to be a medical explanation for that. For some reasons, the cynical ones in church tend to be the ones who've been here the longest. And I'm challenging myself in this as well. And I wonder if God wants to remove our spiritual blindness again. You know, as we grow, our eyes get weaker. And we need to update our prescription so we can see better. But as we grow with God, I hope he's giving us a bigger perspective of what he wants to do, not a smaller one. I hope that God is challenging us to see how he's working in our city and our world in ways we did not expect. That God continues to shock us because God can't be put in our little box. But God is so much bigger than what we know. Many of you know my family. My wife and I had our first child six months ago, Arthur. And he's the absolute cutest baby on the planet. Totally fighting you on that one. Better than your grandkids and your babies. But like most babies, he cries sometimes and he laughs sometimes. And there's not always a great explanation as to why. And sometimes when he's crying, I try to sing him songs that make him smile when he's happy because you know, those are correlated in my mind. Those connect. And we tried this song here and this song there, you know, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star and Skid Skidamarinka Dink. But there's one song that I just pulled out of nowhere. And it's one that my family used to sing to me and my grandmother used to sing to me. And my grandmother emigrated from Ecuador. She's, she was Hispanic. She lived in our house and she'd sing this song to us in Spanish. And I sing it to my son and he giggles when I sing it to him. And it's an old worship song. It's called Open the Eyes of My Heart. It goes, Abres mi ojo, so Cristo. Abres mi ojo, Señor. Yo quiero verte. Yo quiero verte. It means I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And those of you who got offended that I said old, it was written in 2000. It's two decades old. But I sing this song to my son. And at first it was something just to make him giggle and laugh. And then as happens when a young parent is singing to their child or looking at them, all of a sudden it became this really spiritual moment for me when I first did this. And I realized I was praying over my child as I sang to him that I wanted him to see God work, that I wanted his eyes, his spiritual eyes to be open to what God would do in his life, that God would fill his heart with big dreams and he'd have the courage to pursue them, that, that God would fill his mind with a desire to know him and to follow him and to be obedient to him. And church, I want that for us. I want that for this body of believers that here at Revive, we would be a people who see God move and follow him obediently. That we wouldn't sit on the sideline and we wouldn't question it, but we'd say, we're gonna adjust what our perspective is to understand what God is already doing. That we're gonna be the ones who are awake and aware and expecting that God is gonna do the unexpected. See, this is a call to see Jesus work, a call to see that Jesus is doing things beyond our current expectations. God has never been done working in this world and he's not done working now. And church, this, this is the moment that we can look at and say, God, I wanna see you work again. I hope that we as a church wanna see this community change, that Hamburg would change, that Buffalo would change, East Aurora and Springville and Eden would look different because God's people are there being participatory with the Holy Spirit, proclaiming that Jesus is Lord and we have pursued the Father. Church, I want our world to look different because we haven't sat on the sideline, but we have continued to look expectantly for what God will do next. That our eyes have been open and aware and we have seen God work and we will see him work again. That we would open the eyes of our hearts 
that God would allow us who are spiritually blind to see what he is doing now. That he would open our eyes to experience his amazing, mighty works again. That he would open our eyes to see revival in our city, in our homes, in our families. And our world will look different because there's a people who live within the kingdom and who saw the signs Jesus worked and challenged the systems they lived in. We can be that people. Our eyes can be open. Lord, let us see you work. Help us to know you. Help us to pursue you, to proclaim you, to participate with you, God. Let the eyes of our hearts be open and may we see you do things that we don't expect you to do and work in ways that we did not plan for, that we did not pray for, but you had planned, God. Change the ways we think so they're more aligned with you. May our expectations of you grow larger, not smaller. May we be your disciples too. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand as we worship together and call out to God asking for our hearts to be open?
Cable, um, thank you so much. What a blessing to have Cable on our staff. There's no question. Well, as Steve mentioned a couple of weeks ago, he's he, the Lord has called him to a new church. This is Steve's last Sunday with us. Is on Easter is your first weekend preaching at Victory Highway down in the Corning area. And Steve, it's been an incredible year and a half plus having you with us. It's been a joy and. My goodness, we've all appreciated Steve's ministry over that time. I, I know that's true. I know that's true. Thank you. <laughs> Some things are just the way it goes. I was told I, was told I wouldn't have to say it. Thank you. <laughs> I love you. As much as I try. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that, unless you want to share mine. But that's a little that's a little close. Um, but I, I would love to pray for Steve. <laughs> that was. Do we have another microphone? Um, see the sound system. I was telling you it. Why don't we spend some time praying for Steve? If, if you'd like to come up and put your hand on his shoulder, or you can just raise your hand where you're at and let us know that you're with us as we pray. But let's pray for Steve as, um, as he takes this new assignment. So Father, we thank you for our brother Steve. We thank you for the ways in which you've used him here at Revive to, to open the eyes of our hearts, to help us to see you more, to understand you more, to walk more closely with you. And Father, I pray that as he goes to the Corning area at Victory Highway, Father, that his ministry would, would, would excel, that you would speak through him when he opens his mouth as he leads, people would see godly leadership, that he would be the pastor that you've called for this time at that church, and that their ministry would extend, expand beyond the walls of the Corning campus or Elmira, but that, Lord, people would hear and see about you all over that area because of the ministry you've called Steve to. Father, I pray that we would hear great things about what you're doing through him. So Lord, I, I pray for Tammy and the kids as they are in the middle of transition, Lord, that you would give them the peace that transcends all understanding as they walk this out, that all the details that yet need to come together, that you would put them together, that Lord, that Steve and his family would see your hand of blessing upon them each and every day and step of the way. And as Steve speaks on Easter Sunday, I pray that his words would touch hearts, that he would have an impact on that community in amazing ways. We thank you for Steve, and we ask that as he goes, you would do more than he would ever hope or imagine through his ministry. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Steve, thank you for your time, buddy. Thank you. Steve's going to run out to the lobby, so don't, don't stop him. Cable, no, he stopped there. Let him go. I'm just kidding. I'm, he came to you. I know, I know. I'm just kidding. Let him go. You can greet him out there. There's cookies. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Have a great week as you pursue the Father, proclaim Jesus, and participate with the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week.
Hello.